Good afternoon. My name is Talvisha Tariq, and today I will be moderating a panel full of innovative blockchain experts with backgrounds spanning from finance and economics to entrepreneurship and academia. So I will go ahead and let them introduce themselves, and then we'll get into the discussion. Rob, would you like to begin? Sure. My name is Robert Mallory. I teach the blockchain certificate at California State University, San Marcos. Hi everyone, my name is Alex Nascimento. It's a pleasure to be here. I teach blockchain business applications and security tokens at UCLA and we co-founded uh, What's Today, the blockchain at UCLA group. Great, my name is uh, Cameron Dennis. I run the Blockchain Acceleration Foundation, also known as BATH. We're a 501c3 nonprofit that is governed by various blockchain club leaders from around the country. And um, we start accredited courses, we host weekly meetups, we place students at jobs, um, we connect students to blockchain related research opportunities, we apply for grants, we do a bunch of cool stuff. And uh, yeah, it's great to be here. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Badri Narayanan, Gopalakrishnan, and I'm an economist. I work on um, uh, various economic policies, you know, modeling economic policies and impact of technologies on the economy. And I've been doing some work on uh, blockchain. Uh, particularly its impact on trade and uh, uh, various other aspects in the economy. And I teach at uh, University of Washington, Seattle. I, I uh, recently developed a new course called Global Trade and Disruptive Technologies, of which blockchain was part of. Uh, I'll discuss more about it later, but nice, nice meeting everyone. Thank you. Uh, so as we were discussing right before this, um, as you guys know that most of my background is in academia with three undergraduate degrees, two masters and a PhD. So most of my world is in blockchain research, but as uh, innovators in the field that uh, use blockchain applications for uh, business purposes or economics or finance, um, what do you guys feel uh, is an application for blockchain technology that could be beyond just cryptocurrencies? Well, I think cryptocurrencies definitely gets a lot of the attention, especially with the market caps being the way that they are and you know grabbing the front page of the New York Times, Wall Street Journal. But the applicability in terms of a lot of different areas like diamonds, um, packages, um, provenances for works of art, um, really span um, across a number of different industries and I think that have a lot more to be tapped into but being able to trustlessly know that your diamond that you're getting your fiance is coming from a uh, blood-free area or that the painting that you're getting literally was painted or you know by Picasso or coming from a Picasso museum I think that to be able to stamp the authenticity on a lot of these products is really important and blockchain can do it. Yeah, I, I would say that, you know, for the audience of this uh, conference, everyone that's listening to us knows the many different applications of blockchain. On our research at UCLA, we focus a lot on financial regulated or institutional grade products. Uh, such like security token offerings and, and other financial products that are very much familiar to the traditional world. But if I would pose like two big industries that are significantly benefiting from blockchain today is uh, the finance industry because of the automation process and the great reduction of back office costs and definitely supply chain. Uh, like Rob mentioned, if you research what's going, what's going on in China with the Belt and Road Initiative, it's probably going to be the largest supply chain on a blockchain network in the world we've seen so far. So, so, so those are the two areas I think that are significantly benefiting from blockchain today. So for instances, as Rob mentioned, in uh, digitizing assets, uh, I've noticed that there's a lot of confusion in the business realm of what between an STO and an ICO. And blockchain already has a negative connotation attached to it due to the volatility in the crypto markets. Um, but is there 
of preference or uh, based on your research and um, backgrounds, is there a, a recommendation that you would suggest between an STO and an ICO or any differences that, or key differences that would you feel would be important to know? Sure. Uh, you know, there are many differences. Um, I think that the main difference is that a, an STO is a regulated token offering, which you are not breaching any kind of securities law. So if we want to use a very kind of umbrella approach, if you're issuing any kind of investment contract where one party is giving you money and expectations of making money out of that transaction in any way, shape or form, uh, that is a security. And that is a security under the eyes of the SEC, which is the ruling governing party in the US and dictates 40% of the global trades worldwide. So there are spaces for utility tokens in very specific areas of blockchain. But if you're doing anything that it's closely related to an investment contract, I would highly, highly recommend that you uh, go the STO route. Um, so the regulations that surround an STO and make it uh, secure and legitimize the entire process, um, do you think that maybe those were put into place because there's a, an actual confusion for investors between what a coin is and what a token is? And if so, what do you, uh, how would you uh, simplify the difference? Yeah, I, I want to uh, let the other speakers chime in, but just to close on that loop, I think that there's two things here that are important to understand. Securities laws are jurisdictional based. So each jurisdiction has its own securities laws. Why everyone looks at the SEC is that because the US market commands 40% of the trades of equities and bonds worldwide. So if you're, if you're an institutional investor, you look at the 800 pound gorilla in the room to tell you what to do and what not to do, right? Uh, so, so that's the reason why we, everybody in the industry is waiting for the SEC. Uh, but securities law is jurisdictional based. If history plays as guide, there has not been so far in the entire history of securities, a overcompensating international securities law, which is something we're, we're going through with blockchain as, a, as an approach to it. Uh, but if you, if you were talking about regulatory frameworks, the US has already in place the securities framework to issue regulated token offerings all the way back from the Obama administration, which is the Jobs Act, uh, the jumpstart of our business startups. So I highly recommend people listening to us to research that because the regulation is already in place and the SEC already approved a few uh, security token offerings as public offerings, which means you can uh, sell it to anyone in, in the US. So blockchain can be a pretty intimidating and difficult concept for several to learn about or understand. And Audrey and Robert, I see that you have uh, teaching experience in this field what are some of the challenges that you faced when trying to uh, get the extremely complicated parts of the technology through to young students? Sure. Um, actually, the um, you know covering some of the points we discussed before, and also coming to this this aspect, uh, you know the thinking of blockchain as a technology that can solve uh, existing problems. It's it's just like another strategy to solve problems. Uh, that might simplify a lot of it uh, rather than, um, uh, you know, if, if you take like a couple of years ago when uh, blockchain was like a, almost used like a buzzword. So it was being used uh, in many of the, you know, investor uh, meetings and so on, where, you know, we use blockchain for this solution. So, you know, it's going to be a great solution. So that, that kind of approach it, it, it doesn't work anymore. So you have to come up, uh, position blockchain as, you should not even like you should be able to explain your solution without even uh, for example you know using the word blockchain so what is a what is a problem that you're trying to solve and what is a solution and uh, you know explain it in a in a in a simple way and that's the kind of approach that i i take in um, the, the courses i have taught particularly on the interaction between technology and 
and business basically the, my 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 course i floated last year was on global trade and distributed technologies so the, uh, the purpose of the course was for the students to understand the basics and fundamentals uh, at a high level of what is a block what is blockchain and how does it work and uh, then inducing them to think about practical problems and what are the problems in which you know you know blockchain could be a solution what are the problems for which uh, other technologies could be a solution and where do you see a combination of these things uh, like i think some of us are also talking about the interaction between blockchain and ai so uh, i think uh, taking it to a conceptual level can can actually be very helpful and and also there is a disconnect i see in the in the in the industry to some extent between the people who can code who are very technical and people who can think strategically and uh, at a high level uh, I, i think there there is a lot of communication gap where the technologists know what you know all about the code and the details but they may not know some of the high level aspects they may not be thinking along the high level aspects but as a high level thinkers they may not know the details so i think we the curriculum should actually bridge this gap and that is also something that i have been trying to do like the, the the students are usually mixed actually some of them are engineers some of them are uh, you know liberal arts people so that that actually gives that that it that itself solves half of my problem because the, the students are going to interact among themselves they can educate each other on the different perspectives and then i uh, as a as a teacher i also uh, uh, induce the technical people to think about high level stuff and the high level people to think about technical stuff and and that way you can bridge the gap to some extent uh, so i think to be very precise and short uh, to your question um, you know kind of um, uh, uh, demystifying the the technical aspects and explaining the stuff from uh, from the first principles in a simple way uh, i think that would be a great way to teach and trying to teach without using any jargons and explaining the technical terms one by one and going forward so that has been my experience so, uh, maybe rob can add, add further to this Yeah, I think yeah, just sure. crafting the narrative in the sense that like our first course is blockchain fundamentals 1 and you lay that groundwork talking about Satoshi Nakamoto and then Vitalik coming in and how things have progressed relative to ICOs and you kind of build from there. But everyone that's been interested in the technology that have come to me for the class, you know, they're tech savvy, people nowadays are tech savvy and when they are looking to the end goal of stable employment and using their either CS degree or trying to pivot in some way, you know they'll say what can i do with this you know i have the foundation in solidity you know this is great if i want to do something on with a smart contract tra- 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 or whatever but what can i do in terms of long term employment and then i'll say go on linkedin or go on glassdoor and type in blockchain engineer and see the blue chip companies you know involving you know facebook with libra or uh, microsoft and enterprise solution and all the different companies that are embracing it in a real way and that i think is ultimately what makes them turn in terms of whether they'll actually do a full course or study in blockchain and whether they want to pivot into it full time awesome um so cameron i see that you're interested in um developing a a foundation a nonprofit foundation to accelerate blockchain education and adoption uh specifically for uh, a user based internet now um as far as your uh, education and background goes on blockchain how did you first get into it and what led you to developing a found on a whole nonprofit foundation yeah absolutely so um i first got involved in technology back in 2015 um just get involved with bitcoin read about the ethereum white paper in 2016 um got involved then and then i uh, started actually as you know first was most interested in technology that can make the uh, really just the world a better place so i was most focused on food systems and provenance um but then uh after st- running and failing at a startup um i started the blockchain club at uc santa barbara i ran that for about 2 years or so and then uh quickly realized that nonprofit to the schools can accept cryptocurrency so that being said these blockchain organizations can't receive crypto donations for the various events that they put on the hackathons the conferences and what not so how can we align incentives between the companies that are looking to develop the talent in this industry with the talent with the universities themselves so um after graduating i started this 501c3 nonprofit um with the actually the help of the founder of the gnu bash shell Brian Fox and um then i actually couch surfed around california for an entire year going from university to university 
onboarding the blockchain clubs to become uh, board members of the nonprofit. And this way we're actually able to test a more decentralized governance model because our ultimate goal is to create a completely incentive aligned and automated organization. Now that's a big goal. So at first we really just focus on engagement and making sure that we get universities to be the talent machine that this industry needs to fill these jobs that, that Rob was talking about. And, um, you know, we started the first course at UCLA with mouse belt and the blockchain at UCSB. Oh, sorry, blockchain at UCLA. Then we started the first course at UCSB. And um, now we're just getting another course started at UCSB and starting one at UC Davis. So these courses have around about 40 students each. And um, the whole point of them is to give students the intuition to approach the space. Um, there's so many different, you know, rabbit holes to go down. And it's really important that they know what's going on. So, but the thing is, is that there's no single professor who can teach all this stuff, the convergence of distributed systems and cryptography and behavioral economics and all this. So we actually build this curriculum in a way where we bring in guest speakers to teach about this. So um, in our upcoming course at UC Davis, we have people from RSK, from Truffle, from Prismatic Labs, Ethereum Foundation, IBM, um, Dara Hashgraph, Nier, Polkadot, Algorand, the list goes on. And... Um, yeah, so the whole point is to train the talent and then place the talent because at the end of the day, what we wanna be is a trusted matchmaker that is essentially connecting students, to, uh, not just students, but all members to opportunities in the space and eventually automate all of this and the underlying tax incentive, which is really big because if you donate cryptocurrency to a nonprofit and you're based in the US, it's not considered a tax, it's not considered a, a, a taxable event like you would, like it normally would be if you're just trading. So um, that being said, there's a lot of tax benefits. You can essentially write off the price of crypto when you donate to a nonprofit to tangibly accelerate the industry in these various ways, getting research started and courses started and all this stuff. So um, up to now, we are governed by the presence of blockchain at Berkeley, blockchain at UCLA, UCSB, uh, UC Irvine, a um, couple more, Cal Poly, list goes on. But now we're expanding across the country and we do this through conferences and weekly events and essentially connecting people to jobs. Uh, so it seems that you all have uh, some background in education and academia. Um, as professionals with experience independent uh, to your own background, what do you think is a, something about blockchain that isn't widely recognized and is vital or extremely important for the general public to know and understand? We, um, I can mention something about um, uh, some of the research I did uh, recently. Uh, we, we presented it in a forum called World Trade Forum, where um, you know people who work on international trade and uh, they present their findings. So what we did was to look at the the, uh, the possibility of using blockchain uh, as an authentication, uh, you know, uh, technology for the exporters, exporters of different products to show that their product was made in a particular country. Because in many of the uh, you know, trade agreements, if you see, there is a clause, like if you take NAFTA, the previous NAFTA, for example, and even the new US MCA, uh, there is a clause that says that, um, you know, your product that you are exporting within this region should be like 80%, all the 80% of the value, sh value should be within the country, within, within these three regions, three can US, Canada, and Mexico. So uh, until now, from our research, we found that many, many uh, small industries in developed countries and developing countries uh, have suffered a lot because of these requirements, because they are not able to show, um, you know, uh, that they indeed, you know, make most of it locally. So uh, in this kind of situation, blockchain can make a big difference. We actually uh, found the gaps in this area and, um, uh, you know, Assume that if if blockchain can you know fill this gap, like uh, how many uh, you know uh, an exporter from US, a small exporter from US, can potentially sell something duty free to Canada if uh, he, uh, if they can show show that they are producing here. So when we do that kind of analysis at a macro level, we found substantial expansion in trade that is possible because of this. And, and this is just one aspect. There are many such aspects in the area of you know exporting and importing international trade, which is not that much recognized. But gradually, you know, people are talking about it, uh, particularly at the, on the customs procedures at the, the border and so on. And there are some some big projects that are happening now. 
uh, but that that's one uh, one aspect I would emphasize. And the, and the other thing is the the food safety and uh, you know food supply chain uh, you know optimization. Uh, that's something that I've been working on, and and that is also a pretty big area. But that's that's kind of very well known. A lot of people are working on it, and a lot of solutions have been there. Uh, and I think uh, uh, the other uh, there are also many innovative uh, things. I know I know one company which is actually um, uh, doing some blockchain for journalism. So they they're basically aggregating uh, you know articles from different uh, writers and uh, you know have kind of tokenizing that having a mechanism for um, you know unbiased you know unbiased kind of writing. So every article would go through, you know, diff- people from different, you know, points of view and so on. Uh, so there are, there are like this very, very innovative, you know, applications, uh, which probably we don't know much about. Uh, so, yeah, I think we can keep talking about it. There, there are so many interesting applications here, but uh, I think these are a couple of things I wanted to mention briefly. Alex? Uh, yeah. Would I- you like to- on, on, on the area that we focus more, which is finance, uh, we're seeing great advancements. We're seeing over 10 different applications in the US for new security token exchanges coming out in 2021. We see companies like NASDAQ offering a full-fledged solution for security tokens. Uh, we, we see so many different real estate projects. If you're a realtor or a developer out there, blockchain is a fantastic fundraising solution for you. Uh, and tokenizing different real estate projects is, is definitely a low hanging fruit. Um, the amount of banks, and when I mean banks are like the popular ones that everybody knows around the world that tap, um, are tapping into this technology is impressive. We just saw Chase sell the quorum back to consensus. Aside from at UCLA, I am the managing director of 7CC Blockchain Investments, which is an advisory and investing firm. So most of our work is with institutional investors or realtors. Um, and that's definitely an area that, that it's exponentially growing. I think that the jump into the governance with the DAOs is especially important. I think, you know, MakerDAO did it so well and they're splashing onto the scene and other projects have taken that and run. But I really see that the governance shift and projects that are using that type of horizontal type of organization where everyone's involved, everyone's voting on proposals and people can jump in with their ideas and make the organization materially better. I think has a lot of legs. People message me and look at or ask how to pivot into a DAO and what can they do to take on this decentralized architecture where the community itself props up the project and gets enthused by being involved. And um, they like the architecture of being able just to hold it in a you know, MetaMask or what have you. So I think that the DAOs um, should not get lost in the shuffle of the DeFi, which is, you know, I think first and foremost in everyone's mind right now. Yeah, regarding regarding DAOs, I think the most important thing with DAOs, and we see kind of fail all the time, is it requires engagement. People aren't even voting on these like proposals and whatnot. And, you know, that's that's going to take a long time to develop. But one thing that is here now, zero knowledge. Zero knowledge proofs, I believe, are going to be one of the most, probably the most important thing to come out of this entire industry. There's all this money that was poured into 2017. A lot of it went into hardcore research. People are now realizing, you can see Vitalik's blog post from the other day, that Ethereum 2.0 is like going to take a long time. And the best way to scale it was with the ZK rollups and optimistic rollups. Um, so the zero knowledge space is really how we're actually going to get to you know, these, these verifiably private security token offerings. People don't want to put their, their you know, private information on a public blockchain. People, they don't want to, you know, their, their people are asking for like driver's license cards and, you know, sec- um, credit scores. So if we have a zero knowledge proof system at the base layer, you're able to issue verifiably private assets. And actually there's been blog posts about like even ETH 3.0, you know, including some of this stuff, but this is the thing that's missing. And I actually think that this is going to be the, the largest takeaway of this entire industry. And this is how we're actually going to get to a user owned internet where you can verify or prove your assets without actually having to disclose those assets at all. Um, and we're actually running a conference, um, a small plug here, 
October 19th with the best zero knowledge researchers in the space. It's called uh, the ZKP and Privacy Summit. Uh, it's co-organized or primarily organized by Dystopia Labs. BAF is a co-organizer of the event. Zcash will be there. Um, uh, Monero, Mina, you know, all these great projects, Fendora. And um, yeah, highly recommend checking that out if you're really interested in seeing the cutting edge of this tech. All right, well, it seems like we're almost out of time. So on that note, maybe we can launch an ICO to fund the development of a blockchain wiki that runs on blockchain platform in order to, for the average person to educate themselves uh, with verified information without all of the false myths surrounding this particular field. Uh, that was a great discussion. And I hope those who tuned in were meaningfully impacted by the topics discussed today. Thank you. I guys. don't advise anyone starting an ICO. Let's just, I just want <laughs> to say that, yeah. I agree, Section actually. <laughs>